my fellow freedom lovers, sovereign thinkers. Thank you for tuning in to the L03 Podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful Swampy Manual, South Florida. And today's date is Thursday, April 22nd, 2021. Oh, yeah. So, um, just a little bit warm out there in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Plus, I'm at Downtowner, located at 10 South New River Drive East. Along the New River of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, near the courthouse, the county jail, southeast section of the Ave- Andrews Avenue Bridge. So, um, just uh, mellowed out here, just watch a few things, hear multiple sides, examine other stuff, etc. You know, on the convictions and so forth of Derek Chauvin, but I'm not going to go the whole song and dance and all that. However, a few things I want to be addressing here, be mainly two articles and another one, actually three articles on it, or in the blog, or one of the blog, but um, you can make, people make their own judgment on this matter. Uh, so I'm just going to this um caught this caught my attention this morning. Here it just came out from the Daily Mail, which they have so many confounded ads. <laughs> However, this is very interesting. This is an exclusive article here. It says Derek Chauvin's nervous note taken, defiant mugshot, and unmasked emotions. Body language expert analyzes George Floyd's killer, who came across as a sociopath in court. So. What Megan Sheets have to say about this, and um, there's a photo, be lots of photos. So it says here, the eyes of America have been on cop, killer, killer cop Derek Chauvin for the past few weeks as he largely remained silent throughout his trial for the murder of George Floyd, from frantically, frant so uh, from frantically. Sorry about that. Uh, scribbling on a yellow notepad to rapid eye emotions, a biolanguage expert has now revealed hidden, the hidden messages behind his movements. Over 16 days of intense hearings in Minneapolis, court shoving sat in the spotlight as jurors examined extraordinary detail the day he kneeled Floyd's neck during an arrest on May 25, 2020 until the handcuffed black man died. A 45-year-old former cop's fate was finally sealed on Tuesday when the jury found him guilty of second-degree murder, third-degree murder, and second-degree manslaughter. So, um, I'll continue on here. The biolanguage ex- expert Patty Woods spoke to DailyBell.com on Wednesday about key points in the trial that shed light on what Chauvin was thinking and feeling. Wood explained how Chauvin's um, constant note-taking throughout the proceedings may have been an attempt to comfort himself and avoid giving away any reaction that could be perceived negatively by the jury. When he spoke in court for the first time last week to confirm that he would not be testifying in his own defense, Chauvin's erupt um, responses and perfect posture showed heightening awareness and anxiety. Wood said, during his attorney's... um, Eric Nelson's closing statement on Monday shoved and removed his mask in that would describe as a bid to let the jury see his emotion after several witnesses for the prosecution described his demeanor on the day of Floyd's death as callous and uncaring. Then on Tuesday, when the jury returned with his verdict, Wood, Wood said Chauvin's eyes showed a clear shift from fear to anger as he heard each charge filed by guilty in process possibility that he could spend up to 40 years in prison as a result. The last glimpse the world got Chauvin of Chauvin was on Wednesday morning when officials released a booking photo taken at the maximum security prison where he's being held until sentencing. Would, would said Chauvin puffy eyes and dramatic frown shown sadness but held his chin up in a manner that that suggests defiance. 
Now I've seen the video footage, live video footage, on his um, verdict. So there's some merit to some of his thing about when the when the jury found him guilty on these three counts. So I will we'll continue on here on the. Whole would explain that Shevin could be perceived as unfeeling and even sociopathic to some people because his expression remained largely unchanged even when shown the gut-wrenching video of Floyd crying out under the weight of his knee. Of course, there's lots of photos on here, so you can just um, make your own judgment on this. All right. Shovin's eyes revealed his sudden shift from fear to anger as he perceived the verdict. On Tuesday afternoon, Shovin entered the Hennepin County courtroom for the final time to hear Judge Peter Cahill deliver the jury's verdict. He stood as jurors filed into their seats and then sat down before Challen began to read, beginning with the top charge of second-degree murder, guilty. Through the mask was covering his face, Shovin gave away with a lot with his eyes, according to Wood. The fear is clear in the intents of the lower eyelids and the way he is raising his upper eyelids, she said. The rapid eye movement is him processing the verdict as anyone would, first in the emotional limbic brain and going over to the neocortex, to the logical thinking brain to decide how to respond. The um, rapid movement shows his constant attempt to first fear, feel fearful, understand what is being said, and stay calm over and over again. But with mixed and fear are also nonverbal indications of anger, with his eyebrows lowered slightly, are drawn together to the eye, lower eyelid tensions, so we see him glaring. I had enough baseline to, of his normal to detect his shift from fear to anger in these few moments. I would say he did not expect his behavior to have reached this judgment. After verdict, Shevin quickly scribbed something on his hand, what someone believed the phone number of his attorney before he was escorted out in handcuffs. And you can watch the videos yourself. So, um, perfect posture and quick responses during his address to the court showed his anxiety. After hours of testimony from 45 witnesses, the jury briefly heard from Chauvin himself on April 15th when he just declared that he would exercise his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination and to decline and decline to testify. What's interesting about that, I saw the, I heard the audio clip of the judge about Fifth, Fifth Amendment privilege. Shame on you, Judge Chahill. You never use fit you never use Fifth Amendment privilege. It's a right. And I was a little bit disturbed about that myself. Because it's called conditioning folks. Part of the mindset, mind control. And I, I will continue now I will continue on. In a short dialogue with his attorney, Shelvin confirmed that the decision was his own and that he had discussed it at length offering just words of answer of yes and no into a microphone. As for the body language during the brief exchange, what said was striking here is his very erect posture and bearing to see how it seems that there is an invisible ro rod through his back and up through his neck. This is a perfect professional posture and indicates that he's very aware of his circumstances and surroundings which does make sense. So it says here, would also uh, call attention to the way Shovin grasped the microphone. He is holding the microphone down away from his face and in his heart instead over his torso with two with fingers only lightly holding with the, the tips of his fingers extended, he said. He may have been coached to hold the mic in his, in his relaxed, unguarded way but in any case, this placement and grip make it appear he is not tense. We do not. We do see the tell of his anxiety has clipped. Tense. Ra um, rapid replies. His uh, paralanguage that is very tone, tempo, speaking rate, high voice, etc., and his focus on looking. Well, 
at his lawyer in a way that makes it look like he's searching for approval that he's doing that he is doing okay and making the right choice, making him sound scared. And there's a photo of that too. So the one that's held that that makes him look a bit smug as his chin placement. The chin placement is a key place to read for the feeling of confidence. Confidence is shown when the chin is held at the center. He told his uh, he had his neck arched out. And now about the point through, throughout his um, chin above all the center line shows his field superior. I think it's telling because it's very hard to con- for consciously control the chin placement when under stress. So it tends to go as natural baseline of that normal person. And there's a video on that, so go ahead, wa- look at it. Sho- shoving cast his mask over a glimpse of emotion as his attorney delivered the final defense. Shoving wore his mask throughout almost all of the trial as mandated by the court's health rules during the coronavirus pandemic. So in the testimony, he took it off briefly a couple of times so witness, so just, just so witnesses can could identify him from the stand, but then he erupted, erupted put it back up, put it back on. However, when his attorney, Nelson, stepped up to deliver the closing statement for the defense, Shavin removed his mask and kept it off throughout over the three hour um, three hour remarks. Wood said she believes Shovin did so because he wanted the jury to be able to see emotion on his face after many of the witnesses called by the state described him as being devoid of emotion through his fatal restraint of Floyd. I, I think the mask off was an attempt to have the jury read him and potentially see him be emotional, she said. The background of court trials recently has been controversial, and some they have delayed going forward to fear their defendant would won't be seen on Zoom or a mask as a human, innocent, and real. It's a big concern, and if you go see that themselves, of course, Shovin just uh, scribbled on his legal pad constantly to comfort himself and avoid giving any tales. Shovin speak a uh, flurry. Particular social media speculation after he was constantly seen scribbling notes on a uh, video legal path for over 16 days of testimony. It didn't matter who was speaking the judge, his attorney, a prosecutor, or a witness. Shovin always seemed to have pen to, pen to paper. Wood says she's had many clients ask her about what the mannerism means. She has a unique perspective because of her background of coaching clients on how to portray themselves best in official proceedings, including court cases, debates, and congressional hearings. Many of my clients curious about this about this case have asked me about his note-taking. She said, It is standard practice for me to coach my executive and po- politician clients to take notes that they will stay focused and occupied having something to do with their hands as often to go self-comfort cues and overall not to be nervous as not give as many tells. I give caveats to that advice, however, saying it's important at times to show respect, caring, and concern partiality. These caveats were not coached and are shown by shoving. Because he was labeled as unfeeling and lacking of emotion before the trial, it was a mistake for him to take notes so often. Here's a lack of emotion during the very painful testimony may have affected the jury's impression of him negatively. Negatively, And that you have that chin up and often shoulders back as he's taking notes. Looks, He looks more natural and humane when he's relaxed down in his chair here. Chauvin's um, booking photo from prison shows sadness in his eyes and a mouth but defiance in his upturned chin. Wood also offered her analysis of Chauvin's um, first booking photo after the verdict was read and he was um, remanded to M- MCF, Oak Park Heights, Minnesota, um, only, only maximum security prison until sentencing. Uh, the part, uh, Minnesota Department of Corrections released a photo on Wednesday morning as Shovel woke up from the first night at the prison where he could end up at the maximum 
sentence of 40 years, dressed in an orange jump, jumpsuit, shoving appeared, uh, uh, tired and puffy eyed, with a frown in his hair and disarray, disarray, as he thought, though, as, as did he, at, excuse me, as he did through much of the trial, shoving held his chin, an upper angle that would said could signal superiority. There, this, there's a slight of defiance, a slight of defiance in his eyes, and his mouth placed. And he said, downward V, she said. Chauvin's demeanor throughout the trial cast him in a harsh light and caused some people to label him a sociopath. Looking across everything the court saw from Chauvin in the, tr- in the, Chauvin in the trial, Wood said that several of his mannerisms could have been perceived negatively by the jury. The constant wrote, the constant note taking and the chin up, which can be seen even with the mask on, may have uh, been the same, the reason some people label Chauvin as looking unfeeling or even labeling him as a sociopath, she said. An individual has their baseline normal behavior that I use to do to to do a read. And we have a standard of normal, nonverbal behavior for a situation, she explained. Because of the long, horrific video of Floyd's death, this was a, tr- this was a trial that caused many people who saw the video feel horrific and sympathy for the victim. So the baseline of normal response for the, def- the defendant is expected to show a reflection of our normal, even knowing that he feels and considers himself innocent. I know that lawyers may coach a client to show not emotion to make the victim look more guilty. But again, we saw the video of the victim's agony. So that standard laurely advice about how to comport yourself as a defendant in the courtroom. And in this case, did backfire. So it's a very interesting uh, analysis from Dr. Wood. So, um, Dr. Patty Wood. So it's very interesting. And um, sometimes that does uh, does backfire on a person's exhibition. And of course, as, like I said, just give you some examples on this. And um, and like all information I gave in the past podcast pertaining to this incident and tr- and the uh, verdict. Still, 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 I'm um, not gonna change my my thought process but it's always good to know these all these angles hey if you become a juror you may learn a potential juror you may learn something from this by uh, Miss Wood and uh, it's very, very um, it's good it's good to know these things so that's why I'm like had to let people know without the all the exploitation and so forth and um, etc so another thing I'm gonna add, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read here about this is what came from Matt um, Matt Agaris from um, the Free Thought Project came out yesterday. If Derek Chauvin can be found guilty, these cops should be prosecuted as well. And this is what he has to say here. It came out yet. It said on Tuesday uh, on Tuesday, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin found guilty of intentional second degree, unintentional second degree murder, third degree murder, and a second degree manslaughter. And this is like, I'm not to learn Minnesota's law on this. It's like, when I heard that, I'm like, what the hell does that mean? Second, unintentional second degree murder. Like, oh yeah, I had no intent, but I killed my purpose. He was like, what? So, so it's a little bit bizarre here. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to read to make that decision. Um, Shelvin was seen on a video kneeling on the neck of George Floyd, who was handcuffed and not resisting over eight minutes until he died. Had the video of the incident not existed, the chance of Chauvin even being charged would have been non-existent, even with the video of Chauvin's case. It's extremely rare as cops who kill are almost never held accountable. Find a poli- uh, finding a police officer facing a murder charge for an on-duty shooting is like finding a unicorn in your front yard as... Um, TFTP has reported, despite horrifying police killings, many of which were captured on video and rocked the nation, the arrest rates for cops 
who killed people on duty remains as low as ever. According to reports, since 2005, just 126 police officers have been arrested for murder or manslaughter in retaliation to an on-duty killing. Of those 126, just 44 have been convicted, with 31 other cases still pending, and just 8 cops total, including Chauvin, have been convicted of murder. The 37 cops were convicted on charges of ranging from manslaughter to official misconduct, with many of them receiving no jail time. Chauvin's case proves. Chauvin's case is pr- case proves. However, this is indeed possible to charge cops who would necessarily kill people. If he can be convicted of murder, others should be as well. The Free Thought Project has composed a list of killer cops whose crimes were just as or more horrific as Chauvin's, but who were never charged. Mesa Police Officer Philip. Brailsford, Brailsford, Brailsford. On um, January 18, 2016, Mesa Police Officer Philip Brailsford murdered Daniel Shaver on video. Shaver, uh, Shaver, Shaver, a father of two, was unarmed, crawling on his knees, innocent, and begging for his life when the cold-blooded killer opened fire on him in the hotel hallway. I seen that video, folks, and I find that extremely disturbing. Unlike Chauvin, Brailsford will not see the inside of the jail, although he was fired after killing Shaver. Three years later, he was hired back. After he was rehired, he immediately retired from law enforcement, winning the equivalent of a lottery jackpot in retirement earnings. Wichita Police Officer Justin Rapp in in December of 2017 Police responded to a prank call, known, also known as swatting, at a home of Andrew Finch. The prank call, this prank call was made by a man named Terry Tyler Bar- Barris, who did not know Finch, but who led the police to his home anyway. When the entirely, when the entirely innocent and unarmed father answered the door during the raid, Officer Justin Rapp was recorded on video killing him in cold blood. After the coverage died down in the press, and as TFTP accurately predicted, in January 2018, the Wichita District Attorney quietly announced there would be no charges. After letting the cop who did the actual shooting with no charges, the person who made the phone call, Tyler Barris, was sentenced to 20 years. So the question on that, exceptionalism? Think about that, folks. Aurora officers Nathan Woodyard and Jason Rosenblatt and Randy Rodema, as TFTP reported at the time, Elijah McLean was killed by off by police after he was put in the chokehold and given the sedative ketamine. The incident began when someone and the neighborhood called the police because McLean was walking down the street with groceries while wearing a mask. McLean reportedly always wore a mask because he was anemic and often got cold. He was he was an introvert. At the time of the, his death, McLean had never gotten so much as a speeding ticket in his life. Moments after police approached McLean, claiming that he fit the description of a suspect. They claimed they, that he resisted arrest and needed to be subdued. The claim had committed no crime when police initiated force against him. He was merely walking home from the store after purchasing some tea. At the time, police claimed body camera footage showed McLean reaching for a gun, but this was later proven to be false. He is laying on the ground vomiting he is begging. He is saying, I can't breathe. One of the officers says, don't move again. If you move again, I'm calling a dog to bite you. Said Mary Newman, the McLean's a lawyer, completely dismantling the official story. Others, officers, Nathan Woody, Woodyard and Randy Rodema and former officer Jason Rosenblatt were never prosecuted for McLean's death. 
Midlothian police officer and Ian Covey. Early on Sunday morning, back in November 2018, a tragedy took place in Illinois after a hero security guard stopped what was quickly becoming a deadly mass shooting. Instead of being honor for his heroism, he would be shot by police moments later. Jamal Robertson, 26, was working security at Manny's Blue Room when his heroism got him killed. In October of 2020, two years after Robertson's tragedy fell out of the news cycle, police announced that the cop who killed him, Midlothian police officer Ian Covey, would not face charges. The incident began after multiple individuals were asked to leave the bar for being unruly. Witnesses said all the men left and then returned, and one came back in with a gun opening fire into the bar. Everyone else ran for cover. Robertson, according to witnesses, engaged the shooter with his own gun. Robertson then apprehended one of the men involved in the shooting and held him at gunpoint as police showed up. Four people had been shot, but thanks to Robertson, no one else was hit. And those four people were transported to a local hospital and treated for their injuries. Sadly, Robertson would not be so lucky when Officer Covey arrived, he immediately killed this hero. Hmm. Interesting there because um, I'm just wondering if everyone called the police and identified Mr. Robinson as one of the individuals that detained the suspect that worked for security and described in a bar when that would have been like, you know, human element. That would have been given the police an opportunity. Okay, someone captured one of the suspects. So, deputies, um, John Aguilin, George Herrera, Jason Arias, and Johnny Longoria. In December 2017, the three the Free Thought Project reported on the tragic death of six year old Cameron Prescott, whose uh, life was stolen from him when open fire of an, of an unarmed woman suspected of stealing the car. In June of 2018, the family of a little boy who was gunned down by the police found out that the cops who killed their son all went back to work. Then in March of 2019, the family found out none of the officers responsible for the death of her son would face charges. At the same time, the incident um, received widespread coverage as the mainstream media reported that Cameron was hit with a stray bullet, or his bullet was anything but stray. The shot that killed young Cameron was deliberately fired at an unarmed woman. In fact, he was hit twice. The officer's gun down. The officer's gun did not accidentally go off. Deputy John Aguilin, George Herrera, Jesse Aries, Rice, and Johnny Longoria all deliberately shot an unarmed woman and their fear Poor judgment, carelessness led to the death of an innocent child. Field released last year shows DPS helicopter informed the deputies below that Jones was unarmed, but they openly fired anyway, killing her and Cameron in the melee. While it's certain a uh, welcome gesture to see that Derek Chauvin has received justice as a, above cases and the thousands of similar cases prove he was an exception to the rule until more cops are held accountable for killing unarmed. And often innocent people, we can expect more bloodshed. So you can always look at that too. So, um, so like I said, it's just one of those things we got. We got to look at all angles, observe, and so forth. And a lot of questions in this matter. Too many people. Too many folks. They get away with stuff. Sometimes you got a lot of sovereign immunity, unconditional. But things are happening little by little. Like now it does work? Absolutely. Like, okay, like it may be justice for George Floyd. But I'll tell you this, folks. The way, like I said before, the mob mentality is extremely dangerous. Those are things I don't like. All right? And that's why I get a little bit irate 
when I see the mob mentality, when you got like a globalist hack like Maxine Waters comes from another <laughs> district, they go over there and bleep, the world should revolve around her. You know who's done that? The Ku, the, Ku, the, KK, the Ku Klux Klan done that. So did the Nazis and rogue elements within the Hutu government. Mob mentality, mob justice. Just gotta think about that real clearly. This is why I quit, that's why in good faith I still question the verdict. It was, it, was it done in good faith? Or out of fear? And hopefully, hopefully I'm, incur- hopefully I'm wrong about they did it out of fear. That's how I gotta always um, examine. So, and I have to agree. Okay, well, a lot more of these officers that have rogue elements need to be called out. There comes a tyranny under government, governmental institutions. It's got to be done honorably, due process, and all that. That's why many people still question the trial, Chauvin's trial. And there was even uh, reports that he didn't even. Um, they didn't even show the actual cameras, the videos, of the police officers. That's why um, Andrew Branca from uh, Law for Self-Defense is questioning the prosecution's rebuttal. It's not that accurate. So um, I, I'm going to add that to the memo. There's video footage on that, like 30 minutes long, how Mr. Floyd exhibited himself. Claiming to be clo- claustrophobic, and says he couldn't breathe. So, he may be on something. They say Frenel. Yeah. So that's why you have to always examine those. Question everything. Like if shoving, may be excessive. Yeah. Even according, according based on some people that are law enforcement representatives, former bounty hunter talked about that was unnecessary but the way this this particular case was politically motivated and that's disturbing when they announced system system uh, systemic racism from all the athletes all the pundits including Joe President Joe Biden and Kamala Harris they're delivering you nothing more than a monumental lie based on the trial, it was never had nothing to do with race. Period. And the jurors were considered all mixed. Different, you know, ethno, ethnic groups. So, you have to look at that angle as well. And I'm expecting him to get an appeal. This is why, like, I was a little bit, like, like, based on the information I observed and so forth. All three counts should be questionable. I'm not saying the juries are cowards or anything like that. Many people may, many people may say that. I'm not going to use that rhetoric. But if he has a right to appeal, which he does, he might have to go through the go through the system in Minnesota and I can say this I'm expect I'm ex- if he gets a new trial expect to expect the sentence to get reduced when that trial comes maybe or if he pleads guilty one of the counts now that's up to him that's why I can tell people always look at everything a lot broader than what it is and don't rely on the propaganda machine. Exploitation is extremely dangerous. If you got anyone in Congress, any elected servant, have the audacity to instigate, if there's a sheriff in that county, arrest their arrest them and throw their tails in jail for inciting a riot. It's all on its face. The sheriff 
has that power with no exceptions. These individuals, such as globalist hack Maxine Waters, is not an entitlement. Because she's done this in the past. She don't even live in her own district. I'll tell you, do yourself a favor. Take care of your problems in your district, which we don't preside. That's how I look at it. You don't treat these elected officials as kings and queens or prince of princesses. It's princes or princesses. They're not monarchs in the monarchs. And the sheriff has that power to arrest them on the spot with no exceptions. And beware of those synthetic movements, folks. Because I was watching some videos in the past. When he was found guilty, other towns were, um, other areas were mocking the police. It's called collective witch hunting. Ask him how the few have the attributes of a Nazi. They will hate that, but who the hell cares? Because they've done it to the Jews, for an example. Like I said before, collective witch hunting is the road to democide or genocide. What you gotta do is look at the 100 day holocaust in Rwanda. It's self explanatory. And that will be it. I thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share us throughout your social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, or something that's interesting, check out whatever you do. Please send your correspondence to the core. Furthermore, I will leave the footnotes of these articles on my um, speaker page. And if you have any, if you want to contact me, hit me at lokiluckenumbers03 at protonmail.com. Or if you want to donate, hit me at paypal.me or cash.app forward slash lokiluckenumber3. Support the Free Thought Project. If you want to subscribe to the Daily Mail or even the Law of Self-Defense, that will be in that memo where you can see the videos and Mr. Andrew Branca's um, Perspective before the verdict, do it, and um, he's very good too. I, I recommend, I encourage people to support him and his um, and his mission because he's very intelligent, especially when it comes to self defense. All right, folks. Once again, thank you for your time. Please always remember that the maniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love. Glass. May your guardian spirits be with you.